Welcome to this lecture on space mission for detection and characterization of exoplanets. I didn't choose the title nor anything uh, in this presentation. I'm not an expert of space telescopes, so if you know something I don't know, just uh, you know, shout at me. Tell me I'm wrong. Everyone present himself, so I just put a slide here uh, to present myself. So that's me. There's a bunch of stuff here. The nice thing is that I'm currently a research fellow at UCL, where I work on exoplanet atmospheres. Um, I technically got a visiting position to uh, Tokyo University, but I never went. Uh, sorry, Naoji. It's the same-ish. Uh, but as of uh, September 2022, I'll be uh, a research fellow um, at the Space Telescope Institute to work on GEMSWEB and the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. So just down below is um, all the three things I'm very interested in. Uh, the first one is atmospheric codes. So I do write uh, codes. So modeling and things like that. This is uh, what we call an atmospheric retrieval code. This is a model I've developed. Uh, and here it's a population analysis tool to analyze um, exoplanet atmospheres, but like not one, but as populations, so like a number of um, atmospheres. Uh, here, uh, those are the four um, babies I play with. So there is HST, um, Ariel, Spitzer, and GEMSWEB. I'm going to talk about each of them. And I'm interested in developing atmospheric codes to work with data uh, of those telescopes and understand planetary systems in general. Um, as you can see, I'm not a geophysicist uh, nor a, a meteorite expert, so um, I'm very glad to be here today. Then I can uh, learn a lot more about uh, meteorites. And this is now the extent of my knowledge on meteorites. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as I, as I say, if you have something else that I didn't mention and that you're more expert than me, just please uh, don't, don't hesitate to speak up. Um, I've started with a survey because I really liked yesterday um, the quiz that was uh, given, so I've, I've done one. Um, go ahead, <laughs> have fun. Okay, all good. So I'm going to continue now. Any objection? No? Okay. Plan. Um, just before the plan, I'd like to say that, uh, well, it's 3 p.m. We just got lunch, so we're all very tired. I'm tired. So I will ask you to interact with me. And if you have any question on one slide, just please stop me. Ask the question. Don't wait till the end, because I'm not going to answer questions after this talk. I'm just going to go sleep, right? <laughs> now, if you don't, if you don't want to, uh, to answer the question during the talk, it's fine. But please interrupt me if you have anything uh, specific. I'm not going to move too much, because I'm not allowed to, to do so. But usually, I do move. Um, OK, in terms of plan, uh, we start with detection of exoplanets. Then we'll go to characterization of exoplanets and atmospheres. And then we'll talk a little bit about next generation space telescopes. Um, so first, detection of exoplanets. Did you know that the first um, detection of an exoplanet is actually not by uh, Michael, uh, Michel Mayer and um, um, Didier Kellos, but this is by those two guys here in 1992 around a pulsar and not around a normal star. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if we can call a pulsar a normal star or not. Uh, so it was in 1992 and uh, then uh, Mayer and Kellogg uh, got the Nobel Prize for 51 uh, Peg B. Uh, in, so it was a discovery in 1995. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that they uh, found uh, those two planets based on uh, the timing um, of, the, of the pulsar uh, pulsations, which was variating, and a pulsar doesn't variate, so they uh, found out that there was two planets uh, orbiting this one. For uh, Mayer and Kellos, do you know which technique they used? Someone knows? Radio velocity, yes. Is anyone aware of what radio velocity is? OK, cool. I'll talk about it. Um, and uh, then in 2000, uh, HD209 was uh, discovered um, through another technique, which is called transit. Uh, is anyone aware of what a transit is? Oh, so you know transit. Yes? Do you want, do you want to tell us? Um, it's the variation of the 
radiation of the luminosity of a star when the planets um, transit around the star? Absolutely. Do you want to come to the lecture? <laughs> There's actually uh, two discoveries in 2000 uh, by two different independent teams, and those are the light curves that we can get. So this is one first uh, transit, and this is a second transit that was observed uh, by Charbonneau in 2000, and uh, Henry also observed a partial transit. Um, so this is a um, curve that shows uh, the cumulative number of detections uh, in the last, what is that, uh, 40 years. Um, so, and, and uh, this is uh, separated in the different techniques, so radio velocity, transit, and there's a number of other techniques I'm not going to talk about because we don't really detect a lot of planets this way uh, anymore. Uh, but do you know what happened in 2009 that uh, basically jumped this number of detection from basically, like what, uh, 400 up to 5,000 now? Yes? Yeah, and you don't have to like raise the hand, just shout the answer, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so now we know more than 4,800 planets. They have been detected by uh, various detection methods. Uh, the main two are the transit and the radio velocity. The um, cool thing about those two methods is they are very complementary. So with transit, we can get constraint on the radius of the planet, and with radio velocity, we can get mass. Uh, the revolution uh, here, in 2009 was uh, Kepler. There was a number of other telescopes involved, so Corot and TESS are space telescopes, then uh, Gaia is also a space telescope. Do you know what Gaia do? Astrometry? No? Okay, I'll talk about it a little bit. And ground-based telescope. So from um, those telescopes, we can get uh, the mass, the radius, and the orbital element uh, of all of those planets, which is quite nice. We can already learn a lot of things about it. So by detecting the planet, we also sort of characterize them a little bit. So I have this slide to show what radial velocity is. Someone want to explain what is happening here? Oh, it's too intense, isn't it? OK, so I can explain it if you want. So there's, why is it shaking? OK. There's a star in the center and a planet orbit. The planet um, influences the star via gravitational pull. And if you take a spectrum at very high resolution of the star, then the spectral lines of the star will um, shift a little bit by Doppler shifting. And this is basically a periodic event that you can characterize. And from there, you can, if you know the mass of the star, you can uh, determine what the mass of the planet is. So it provides. It provides the mass. Um, it's a cool technique, but it's not um, perfect. It's biased towards massive planet because the more massive it is, the more it's going to influence that um, sort of like uh, wobble. Um, and it's also very uh, sensitive to close in planet, but not planets that are far away from uh, the star. It's usually done from the ground because you need uh, quite high resolution to get those uh, spectral lines. Uh, then there is the transit. The, I don't know who, 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 tell, who told about the transit, I think. Yes, you did. Um, so it's basically when the planet goes in front of the star, uh, it gives the radius. There was a question in the quiz about the, radi the radius of a, um, um, sorry, the signal of a Jupiter-sized planet. Do you know how to get that information? Did someone find it? No, really? Okay. Well, I'll explain later or you can find it. Uh, but it's quite easy, actually. If you think about it, the radius is giving you the area of the, sh the shadow. So you can just compute the area of the uh, star and the area uh, of the planet when it's eclipsing, so the shadow. And you can just do um, a normalized quantity to know how much it must decrease. The answer was about 1%, I think, for a Jupiter-sized planet around a sun-like star. So we're looking at 1% variations in um, the stellar luminosity, basically. Um, it's also biased towards large planets, not massive, but large planets, uh, of course, and closing planets. Um, it's done from the ground and space. So what is cool, as I said before, is you can combine LV and uh, transit to get information on mass and radius of those planets, which is uh, starting to tell us something. 
Um, so this is a small image of the Kepler Space Telescope that we just said it revolutionized the field. Uh, why? Because it uh, detected about 4,800 planets. It was dedicated to just do that, to detect exoplanet uh, via the transit method. It's about one uh, meter size. Um, and the primary mission finished in 2013 uh, when two of the four reaction wheel broke. It's a cool anecdote. Do you know what they did after at NASA? Come on, surely someone knows. Because Kepler has been active to 2018. Sorry? Yes, so what is the principle of K2? I don't know, but it's an exception. Yeah. So Yes, um, but Kep Kepler, so the end of the Kepler mission was when those two reaction wheels broke. Do you know what the reaction wheel they do, what they do? They allow to control the telescope in terms of um, like where it's pointing. So if you, if you break two out of the four, you only have two remaining reaction wheels and you can only point in two axes. But you need three axes to be stable and be able to observe. Uh, a target uh, continuously, which is what you want for transit. So what, what do you think they did? It's not that obvious. It's a bit, uh, I mean, I'm always amazed when, um, when I think about what they did at NASA. Okay, so they did this. They uh, put in service K2, uh, which was a second light, so they reborn uh, Kepler, and they balanced the third axis with the solar wind. So if you see here, uh, we can't really see it in those pictures, but the uh, solar panels are quite uh, nicely angled um, and, and they are uh, symmetric. So they uh, basically um, uh, balance the third axis by just having the, the, the stellar, uh, uh, the, the sun pressure uh, going exactly here um, at the center of the, solar, uh, of the uh, solar panel, which gives them the third axis control. And um, so they did that, used the telescope uh, for uh, four more years and detected a massive number of uh, exoplanets with this. The screen is not amazing, but Kepler was supposed to just observe this little uh, patch of the sky. So it observed only here uh, for the first part of the mission. And with K2, because you need to actually have um, the uh, stellar wind with a specific angle, they were forced to sort of uh, follow some specific pattern. So uh, those are sectors. They basically shift the telescope by 80, uh, 90 degrees every time uh, that the stellar pressure is not good enough. They shift by 80 degrees. So you have, I can't, I can't see the number, but I think you have one, two, three, four, must be here or something, five, six, and goes continued continuously with uh, shifting by 80, uh, 90 degrees uh, every time. Do you have any question or do you want to interact? No question, you're sleeping. The crème anglaise was too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, th now this is the revolution. In 2018, uh, NASA sent uh, TESS, so the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, where the goal now is not to look at one specific patch of the sky, but to actually cover the whole sky and uh, detect exoplanets for the entire uh, sky. It's composed of four different small cameras, so it's much smaller than Kepler, so it doesn't have the sensi sensitivity of Kepler, but it observed the whole sky, which is quite nice. Um, there was a two-year primary mission, and it's been extended for two more years because it's so successful at finding candidates, and we now have around uh, 5,000 uh, planetary candidates. So if you add up what we know already, which is like 4,800, and you assume that most of them are actu actual planets, then it gives, it gives you um, an idea of uh, the number of planets we actually have in, in our catalog at this point. Um, why are they candidates, do you know? Usually you have to observe another, like multiple uh, transit events, but you also want to observe it with uh, multiple techniques. So for example, you'll get radio velocity on top to verify that the mass is uh, consistent with a planet because you can have uh, full signature, for example, stars, have, uh, they also have periodic uh, events, or uh, a brown dwarf could go around a star and it would technically create a, a signal that is pretty uh, similar. So yeah, all of those candidates, they need follow-up observations to be confirmed, but 
it's likely that a significant fraction of them are actual planets. So I've put this uh, video to show you, uh, does it work? Yes. To show you the uh, observing strategy of this. So this is Kepler, the field of Kepler, and this is one of the small camera. And you have four of them observing at the same time. This is a one month observation. So we stay for one month here. And you rotate every month until you've covered the whole sky. And in two years, you uh, basically have covered everything. In the extended mission, they'll go back to the uh, southern hem hemisphere and also uh, this portion here, which has not been uh, covered uh, yet. It's only a two-year mission. If you want to um, get a planet and be sure that this is a planet, you need at least two events, two transit events, or maybe you want a little bit more. So it tells you something about the period that the planet needs to have to be observed in a two-year mission. Do you, see, uh, do you see what I mean? So if you, for example, with TESS, one of the big biases that we have is it's only observing for a month a portion of the sky, which means you can only get planets that have uh, orbital period less than 15 days, for example. So with Kepler, the strategy was a bit different. Does that make sense? Yes? Good question, though. Other questions, comments? Someone expert on Kepler or TESS who wants to? Okay, so this is a test uh, light curve of uh, was 60, 62b. That's a uh, uh, hot Jupiter, and you can see here um, the uh, transit events that are happening very periodically. So from there, you can just face fold uh, the data or fit the whole uh, light curve. There is a bunch of systematic you need to account for. It's likely to be the star or the instrument, uh, and then you can get uh, your parameters for the planet, which are uh, usually the radius. Um, for transit. Gaia, so no one knows what Gaia does. It does star, right? This is uh, written here. <laughs> but thank you. Yes, this is exactly the objective. So, oh, do you think we can use that to detect exoplanets? So we have basically, uh, what was said is we have very accurate position, velocity through time of uh, where the stars are going, what can we do with that? Velocity. Almost, it's no radial velocity, because radial velocity by radial means it's in the radial direction that you're looking at the star wobbles, but you also look at the star wobbles, so it's good answer, partial answer. Um, so yes, you know basically where the star is um, uh, very precisely and you will look at periodic uh, movement of the star uh, as compared to the sky background and that would basically indicate that there is a planet that is sort of orbiting and you can get information like the mass, the orbital period, things like that. It's quite interesting. Problem is the low sampling rate. Uh, it only observes a star for 15 times a year, which makes it very difficult uh, to detect planet with this technique, or at least with Gaia. Um, Plato. Okay. Uh, so the, the goal, it's a European Space Agency mission. It's not launched yet, it's 2026. Uh, the goal is uh, to detect, in this case, uh, rocky exoplanets around bright stars. So it's basically looking at Earth 2.0, uh, or looking at uh, planets that, are, um, with, that have the same uh, characteristics as Earth. Uh, so it has a bunch of small uh, camera, and this is going to be a four-year uh, mission. So the goal is also to ob obtain very uh, high precision on the uh, radius of all of those planets detected, and that gives us density. Um, when you combine with the mass, there is on top of um, getting the radius, they will follow up those observations with radial velocity, which will give so very accurate radius and very accurate mass, and then we can uh, make up the density of all the planets, uh, again, in the earth size regime. So it is quite, uh, quite nice. Three uh, percent. You can't read it. It's yes, with plat. It's a good question. I don't know. 
I don't know, probably less, but I guess why it's impressive is it's 3% for um, small uh, rocky planets, right? And if you, I think uh, I have a plot of a few slides uh, after, remind me to check whether there is any planet that looks like Earth in this plot. Because in terms of detection so far, we've been very um, biased towards the big hot Jupiters, right? So we, with Kepler, we've also detected small, uh, um, uh, maybe super Earth-sized planet, but they are in a much closer orbit, so like with uh, very uh, uh, short periods. So yeah, this is looking at a different population. Um, yes, any question? Oh, look, there are questions. It's so nice. So it's cool if you detect rocky planets, but you deduce that it's a rocky planet only by the density of the planet, and it's complicated like if we have many combinations Yes. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So uh, if you get mass and radius for the big one, it's it's actually easy because the big one have a low density, so you can say okay, they are probably gaseous. But you probably know from the solar system, it's difficult to say what the interior of those planet is, right? It could be like a core with some gaseous envelope. Uh, for the very uh, small ones. You can always say they are rocky because when you have a density um, that is consistent with Earth, for example, it can't have a significant fraction of um, a gas envelope. So it can be rocky with a secondary atmosphere or just like a bare rock uh, object like, um, like meteorites. Um, um, okay, so they fixed the threshold and said that potentially in their days it's possible Yes, and you have this region, so you know all of those planets we call uh, sub-Neptune, super-Earth, all of that. We actually don't know what they are. We have no clue. They can be icy, rocky, with large uh, gaseous envelope, just pure gas with just core of iron, and it's difficult to say. When uh, we classify planets as being Earth-like, we mean they're roughly the size and the mass of Earth. Um, I don't think people have used this term for uh, meaning that they are like temperate, because in this case they would use temperate Earth-like planet or something like this. Um, yeah, but um, I, I, I totally disagree uh, in general with the way people are naming uh, planet into different categories, because it's, it's very um, ambiguous in some cases. We find a Jupiter around any type of star, they are rare very rare in terms of frequency when you you know when you correct for all of the systematics uh sorry for all the detection biases we actually can tell that they are rare but we detect them primarily because they are big and and they orbit um, um, with short orbital periods so you have a lot of those events um, but um, yeah we detect any kind we detect uh, um, hot Jupiter, but also small planets in very close orbit. I'll talk about one of them, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, a bit later. Other questions since we are here? It's absolutely okay if we don't go to the end of the slides, right? We can just stay uh, on this slide forever. <laughs> I have this discussion and I can finish any time at dinner or something. I'm just going to move on a little bit um, and talk about the planets now. So hot Jupiter, I've chosen just one example why is it moving so much? Uh, I've chosen just one example per category because uh, there are actually plenty. No, actually for Jupiter I have a few because those are my favorite, but um, my second favorite. Um, anyway, so I've chosen this one, HD209, because uh, this is uh, the first one that has been detected uh, in 2000. I've put a number of references. This is not exhaustive. People for this planet, they're like, thousands of papers, maybe not thousands, but um, this is just an idea. If you're really interested in one particular planet, just start looking at this paper and then you can move on to the other ones. Uh, but basically, this is a 1.38 uh, Jupiter radius, a bit bigger than Jupiter, but it orbits in 3.5 days, which means it has a temperature of 1,500 Kelvin. Um, and this was the first transiting exoplanet, so I put it here uh, as a reference. Uh, then KLT 11b uh, is interesting because uh, it's also a big one. It's 1.37 um, Earth radius, but if you look at the mass, this is really tiny, right? 0 0.2 uh, um, times the mass of Jupiter. So it's what we call, I mean, 
the price calls that a super buff. Um, and it has a very, very low density. So it's very difficult to explain why those planets can exist. Um, and I don't know. But anyway, it's also very hot. Uh, there are a few papers here, if you're interested. Um, Kerl 9b, so we start uh, having some uh, animations. Uh, I like this one because it's the uh, hottest exoplanet we know uh, to date. It's about 4,000 Kelvin. It orbits a big uh, A star and it orbits very close, 1.5 days. It's not uh, tidally disrupted, uh, like destructed, but it's on the verge. It's very uh, close. Um, it's also interesting because it's, so it's evaporating. So in the animation, it's a NASA animation, but they uh, make it look like a comet because it's actually evaporating a lot. And it's also in a misaligned orbit, as in the star you can see here is orbiting um, on the counter direction from like at the 90 degree angle as compared to the orbit of the planet. So it's pretty interesting. How did this planet end up here, right? Um, any question or comment? Do you know why the planet ended up here? Because I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, then we have those uh, sub-Neptune planets. So um, they are smaller than Neptune, bigger than Earth. Um, this one has a 1.6 uh, days orbit. Um, it's called GJ1214. It was the first discovered uh, in this class of object that we actually don't have in the solar system. We don't have planet between Earth and um, like Neptune, right? Um, and those are the most abundant objects that we observe, actually. So it's a mystery. Why do we observe all of those objects, but we don't have any in the solar system, right? Um, it's also uh, interesting because the internal composition is totally unknown. Um, it has, it is, it, it's in uh, this regime where uh, the mass and radius give you a density, but it's a little bit higher than uh, just being um, uh, full gaseous, full hydrogen helium, but it's not quite rocky, so it's somewhere in the middle, and we don't know what the internal structure of those objects is. Um, there was a spectrum, I don't know if you're familiar with spectra, but that basically means that we looked at the atmosphere of this planet, and it was like, oh, we can actually fit anything to the data points, right? Uh, it can be uh, full solar composition or 100% water atmosphere or some mix with hydrogen and water. So it didn't tell us much more. What we think happened here is it's actually cloudy. Uh, so the clouds are sort of masking everything, uh, every um, uh, atmospheric signatures that could be there and we don't, we don't see anything. Uh, there is also like a literature that is massive on this object. Um, then able planet, I don't really know why I put this one here because it's Trappist 1f, but I'm talking about the Trappist planets after. Um, I guess it's interesting because all of the planets we are looking at at the moment are tidally locked. So basically keep in mind when someone talks about a planet, uh, it's likely to be tidally locked. So it has a very different condition on one side and the other side. There's a night and a day side. Um, this one has temperature and is remarkably similar to Earth. So it's uh, one that is going to be scrutinized by James Webb quite a lot. Um, yeah, those are some papers. There is also a uh, um, HST observation of the atmosphere, which tells us that this is not, this doesn't have a hydrogen um, dominated envelope without clouds. Okay, doesn't tell us much more. But um, K218b, uh, so I put it in water world, but honestly, sub-Neptunes, water world, they are the same, and super Earth, they are also the same. We don't really know what they are, um, because again, they are in this density region where there is no uh, uh, real way to say what the internal composition is. Uh, this one made the news because uh, the temperature is uh, 270 Kelvin, which is quite uh, temperate and it's the most uh, temperate planet uh, for which water detection, the most temperate and, and the smallest planet for which detection of water has been uh, done. So there is water in this planet. 
Now we don't know how much. We don't know uh, if this is a water world, if this is an hydrogen dominated uh, planet with some trace of water. It's impossible to say at this point. So again, this one's going to be uh, observed a lot by James Webb. Uh, I put this graph here that uh, provides some uh, different composition, uh, internal composition models. Uh, so if you follow the line, this is high on. So if the planet was 100% uh, high on for a mass of 10, it would be here in terms of radius, right? And then there are different um, um, composition lines. So uh, silicate, pure water, and then some mix of other things. The only important uh, point to take out this graph is all the lines, they go here. The only thing we have uh, for those planets, most of them, is just like how much light is decreased in the stars. So we don't, yeah, we don't do mapping of those things, right? Um, what do you want to know about able planets? It was suggested that the, if this planet had an ocean, uh, it would have to have one side which is uh, warm enough to, for it to be in the liquid form. But on the night side, it wouldn't be this temperature, right? It would be like something like minus something, so it would have to be icy. But it doesn't mean that this planet looked like that, right? I just put it here to discuss tidally locked planet, right? Does that make sense? Yes? Uh, cool, any other question? Any comment? Do you know more planets? Because there are a lot more. Um, so you were talking about lava planets. 55 Cancri is one of them. It's a little bit uh, larger than uh, Earth, but it orbits in 0 0.7 days. So it has temperature of 2,500 planet, uh, Kelvin. Sorry. Um, what I like about this planet is on one side, the temperatures are high enough to sort of vaporize all of the rocky uh, surface. So you would have something like a lava um, ocean and some of that vapor would contaminate the atmosphere. So if you were able to observe the atmosphere of this kind of planet, um, you would technically find some uh, rocky element like, uh, I don't know, t titanium or uh, sodium, things like that, which would help you to eventually link to the interior internal structure of the planet and maybe how it formed or something like that. Um, and there is actually observation of this planet uh, for the atmosphere and HCN was detected. Okay, but another paper said that actually there is no atmosphere on this planet. So. Who knows? Um, so now uh, the TRAPPIST system, so this is a pretty cool uh, system. I have a nice video here that I'm going to let you enjoy. And it basically pre presents an um, artist impression of what all the planets are here. And then I'll tell you what, how those artist impressions have been done. I'll show you what the data looks like. I think this is D, so this one. E, maybe. You'll recognize the A, A, ball, A ball planet, F. And all of those planets, so they orbit an M dwarf which means the energy output of the star is very small, but they orbit from very uh, close in hot regions to temperate regions to very cold regions. But this whole system fits here, like here, in the solar system. So Mac Mercury, I don't know if you can see in those slides, but Mercury is here. Um, it's just like a mini um, uh, multi-planetary system. So do you want to see the data? You don't have the choice. I'm controlling the slides, right? Uh, so that's the data. We know all of this. We've done all of those um, artist impressions based on that, right? So uh, planets are cool, but yeah, it's a bit, um, there is a lot of interpretation when we see those things. We, of course, have models and so on, but keep in mind that we actually don't 
know a lot about those planets uh, yet, especially the small ones, because they are difficult to observe. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, so they had to, because the system has a lot of planets, they had to decorrelate this very uh, complicated uh, light curve. So you have to actually model the whole system. And there's a lot of interesting uh, um, orbital dynamics that happens here. So it's quite nice. Question, comments, Trappist experts. Did you get the question right when I said, uh, what is Trappist yeah. in the questionnaire? So what? <laughs> Excellent. Didn't get tricked. It's nice. Uh, OK, so basically, just to, so I've shown you a few examples just to ex expand a little bit uh, now. Uh, so basically, we have all of those classes, but there are even more diversity in exoplanets, right? So exoplanets are very diverse. Um, we, it's like, it's like fiction, basically. You can take any planet from any of the space uh, movie, and I'm sure that exists, basically. Um, they are also ubiquitous. OK, so that's the graph where I needed to see. OK, one AU. OK, see? So that's where Earth would be. And we don't detect any planet here. It's not because there are no planets here. It's because our detection techniques are limited, right? So Kepler, uh, sorry, not Kepler, Pl Plato, technically will help us fill this gap here, right? Uh, I think all of those planets are detected via radio velocity. So all of those big ones, but quite far away because <coughs> the um, semi-major axis is too large. So they have a long orbital period. They are too large, too far away to be picked up easily by Kepler or TESS. Um, and all of those here on this side here are uh, transiting planets. Um, maybe not all of them, but. Do we have enough precision to know if uh, the planet has a moon? Good question. There was one uh, candidate, candidate I, I think. Uh, you can type it's David Kipping and Alex Tichy. Um, so they observe a sort of like a double um, transit multiple times with Kepler on one system. And they followed up with HST and said, OK, it's also in the HST data. So it's consistent with the moon. They run a significant amount of model. But I think it stayed at the candidate uh, uh, level, basically. There is no confirmation of it. I think F is very similar to Earth in terms of uh, equilibrium temperature and size, I think. So that, that's why people are going crazy for those. So for F, it's located where there is exactly just the right amount of light, right? But we don't know if it has an atmosphere, nor if it has water, because we don't know where, where this planet formed, how it formed. If the star was active, a lot of UV, you can, you can you know, evaporate a lot, a lot of the atmosphere. Um, so maybe it doesn't have an atmosphere. But I think um, models suggest that they are likely to have atmospheres. But, but we don't know from observations. And I tend to be convinced by observations more. Any other question on those planets? It's too bad that we don't have a Trappist expert. But. OK, um, so all of that, I think we saw this, this is OK. Uh, yeah, so the other point I wanted to make in this slide is, uh, so that's the frequency of planets and sort of their class, or if you want, their um, size. So you can see, actually, the gas giant, the large planet, are quite uh, rare, even the hot Jupiters they are quite rare, if, even though we detect a lot of them. Uh, but the planets that are the most common are those class, so the super Earth and the mini Neptunes. And we have no clue what they are made of, right? So um, on top of being very diverse, exoplanets are also ubiquitous. Well, I guess so Jupiter, they are just the planets that have the size of Jupiter and that are very hot, right? They have temperature. I don't know, hot could be something around 
more than a thousand Kelvin. Under under a thousand Kelvin, you'll be more in the uh, warm. People would be would tend to call that call that warm. Um, I think. Um, but then the class the classes are a bit. You know, the boundaries they are not well known, right? It's a it's a continuous. Um, or at least it looks like this is continuous. Um, there is some occasion where it doesn't look like this is continuous and this is subject to a lot of debate. And this is why some people are calling super Earth, super Earth and super Earth, uh, well, sub Neptune, sub Neptune, because they fall in the same regime, but they are sort of coming from two different populations, it looks, it looks like. So I'm going to show that now, basically. So the same plot um, I had just before that shows the um, number of exoplanets, so the frequency of the different type of planet as a function of planet size. Again, the large planets that are uh, here, so the Jupiter-sized planet or hot, hot Jupiter, Saturn planet, they are here. But we find that most of the planets they are in this regime, which is larger than uh, Earth, but smaller than Neptune, right? So. Um, we don't have them in the solar system, we don't know how they are. And on top of it, if you have enough granularity to sort of like, you know, uh, make uh, the, those frequency precise, you can see that they are coming in two different like population, a bimodal distribution, basically. So people have started calling this region uh, Super Earth and this region Sub Neptune. But really, we don't know if they look like Neptune or if they look like um, Earth, basically. And on top of it, this is just um, the, for most of them, the only information we have is radius and mass. So from radius and mass, you have density. Um, so I, I like to call them transitional worlds because then it's not ambiguous, it's transitional. Uh, we don't know if the transition is, is smooth or, or uh, if it's uh, sharp, basically, if they go from there to there in a very sharp way or if there are a lot here and this is just our precision, which is not good enough to see the transition. Um, so on top of it, for those planets with mass and radius only, this is degenerate. We don't know what the interior is. So they could be um, something like this with a high on core, rocky mantle, and some hydrogen envelope. But they could equally have a layer of uh, water um, a little bit in, in between, um, and a hydrogen uh, envelope. Or they could just be pure bowls of water. For all we know, with mass and radius, we can do all of those three solutions, right? On top of it, those solutions, uh, they depend a lot on the equations of state that we use, and we don't quite know um, all of the information for those objects. So to me, it's very uh, difficult to actually tell what they are. Um, one way, and this is one of my motivation to do atmosphere, is to observe the atmosphere because then you get an additional constraint to, to your system. If you can tell, okay, actually the atmosphere is water rich, then it tells you something maybe. Or if it's hydrogen rich and very dry, it tells you something else. Um, so there is this question that I think is fundamental and James Webb is going to help us to solve that. So what are exoplanets made of? Um, also, how do planets form and evolve? Um, I like to say that we have ALMA observation of disks. This is nice. This is our initial condition. We have disks, right? And planets form in there. But essentially, um, the exoplanets at the end, they are the outcome of planetary formation, right? So you have an image of the initial picture and the final picture. But this path between uh, here and here is not yet completely understood. And this is true also here in the solar system, right? So by looking at exoplanet more and atmosphere, we can hopefully constrain uh, planetary formation models and understand a little bit more how all of those systems evolve um, and dueling between atmospheres and planetary formation mechanisms. Um, and then again, a last motivation, which I really like. I don't know anything about the solar system, but I do like to think that, uh, that the solar system is just one outcome of planetary formation, right? It's just one scenario we have. We can study it a lot by doing in situ measurements and stuff, but it's only going to tell us uh, something at to a point, right? To understand the fundamental mechanisms that are behind planetary formation, we are likely um, we likely want to see more outcomes of this 
right? And by looking exo at, at planetary system and stuff, we can get more out more uh, um, outcome of planetary formation and eventually fit it back to uh, solar system science, right? For example, <coughs> you probably know more than me, but do we know why uh, water is on Earth? I take that as a no. Do we know why we have two gas giant planets and they are far away? Do we know why we don't have uh, super, super Earth and sub Neptunes or sub Neptune transitional worlds? Okay. So, yeah, I think those questions are quite essential to answer, I even if we want to understand the solar system. Um, so, it's putting, uh, sorry, it's going too far. It's putting the solar system in a galactic context, basically. Uh, okay. Any question on this part? This was only about detection and only by having mass and radius as constraints. The first measurement that you can do if you know how far the exoplanet is from the star is to do a rough calculation of the equilibrium temperature, right? This is what they state in a lot of papers. Uh, however, you know from the solar system it's not an accurate uh, measurement. So you can, do, you can observe atmospheres and get information about the temperature from the atmosphere as well, um, which I think is a different kind. It's a different information, right? So I'm going to move on a little bit to the characterization of exoplanets then. Uh, so there are three main techniques so far. We've talked about uh, transit and radio velocity, a little bit about uh, um, direct imaging um, and so on. But for atmospheres, people have actually looked at other techniques as well. So you have a planet orbiting here. Um, it can take a big space telescope and look at the transit, of course, which is quite nice, uh, get a lot of information. Uh, but you can also look at the uh, day side of the planet by looking at the eclipse, right? Because remember, those planets are tidally locked. They have a night side, a day side, right? So when it goes uh, in transit, you're looking at the terminator region, right? When you're looking at the eclipse, you're, looking, you're, you're basically probing the day side of the planet, right? Some people also have analyzed the whole, uh, it's coming, yeah. Uh, the whole information. So if you have enough telescope time to observe a planet for two days, then you can constrain the entire phase curve, which is quite nice. Um, okay. Um, no, uh, I should talk about Keops, uh, which is a, uh, sp a space telescope um, that has been launched in uh, 2019. It's led by the European Space Agency. And the goal is to determine uh, the size of known exoplanet. Uh, so it's only doing characterization. It's not looking at detecting planets. It's uh, uh, characterizing um, planets that are already known. Um, it conducts in-depth observation of known exoplanet. And uh, I think someone in this uh, class is more expert than me on Keops. Uh, so if she wants to discuss this, uh, she can take the lead. Well, I've just added a few examples of observations that have been done with Keops, which I find uh, particularly interesting. So there is this planet, WASP-189b. Uh, um, um, so it's a hot Jupiter, it's a very hot planet, um, and it orbits a star um, that is a fast rotator. So the star is actually not spherical, it's a bit of a potato-shaped star. Um, and with Keops, um, so this is uh, the observation from Keops uh, here, you can uh, fit the light curve that has been observed there, and from this light curve you, guess, you can see uh, that depending on the model you use, um, you get different type of systematics, like of uh, residuals. Uh, and the model that is used uh, here, so I think this is, which one is this one? Well, um, the nice one, basically, the one that has uh, GD, so it's called uh, gravity darkening, is because the star, by being um, a potato shape, um, has a different uh, darkening depending on the direction you look at the star, like uh, radially. 
Um, so by looking at this effect and by correcting these um, residuals, you can actually figure out uh, what is exactly the orbit of the planet around these stars. I, find, I found that quite uh, fascinating and quite interesting. Um, yeah. There's also this uh, nice system, uh, TY178, um, which has been observed by Kerbs. It's a pretty um, um, nice system with a lot of resonances. That's a GIF I found on Google uh, that shows the orbit of all, all of the different planets, and they are all in resonance. It's quite, uh, I mean, not all, I think five are in resonance out of the six planets. Um, we know also that the four outer planets are gaseous and the, few, the two uh, inner ones are rocky. Um, it's quite a nice system. It's a bit similar to the TRAPPIST system, um, if you want. Also put the um, uh, observations from curves just to show your messy this is. Uh, so it's transiting uh, all the time, basically. And you have like multiple transits at the same time. Um, so the moon observation, the observation from Kepler to detect the moon, I think someone asked a question about the moon, uh, was based on similar uh, shapes, basically. You have the initial um, transit, and then you have an additional just after that comes uh, and was uh, deemed as being a, a good candidate for the moons. Um, Okay, so that's UI178. Do you have any other question, any question on um, this part or any comment, any other Kiobs anecdote? No? So you're talking about stellar activity, like um, um, stellar spots, faculty, things like that. Yeah, it's very annoying because, uh, yeah, this is annoying, especially for atmospheres. I think for detection, uh, we can pretty much rule it out. Um, after some observation, uh, a significant number of observations, you can rule out a false detection as being stellar spot quite easily. But for the atmospheres, it actually creates a um, signal that, you ca that can mimic uh, atmospheric signals, like, um, for example, uh, Rayleigh scattering and things like that. So it's, um, it's a little bit... Um, annoying for stars that are active. Most people just like avoid to talk about it, basically. Okay, so Hubble is still the state of the art for uh, exoplanet atmospheric characterization. It was sent in 1990 and um, it was not aimed at doing atmospheres, right? Because remember, back in the day, we didn't know about exoplanets. In fact, we discovered exoplanets after, right? Um, so it's a general purpose observatory that was uh, repurposed to do atmospheric studies. Um, it's 2.4 meter in diameter, which means it's quite uh, large. Um, and it will end in 2030, 2040, hopefully. Um, we can use it for, uh, for a bit longer. It was serviced five times um, in space by uh, the, um, uh, the, the NASA with the space shuttle back in the day, and the WFC3 camera, which is what is used for exoplanetary characterization most of the time now, uh, was installed only in 2009, right? So I have this uh, image, which is quite interesting, uh, of Hubble at, uh, of the same galaxy at three different uh, times, right? This was the image from 1993, um, when basically, um, let's put it this way, they uh, didn't make the Hubble, uh, uh, the Hubble mirror, mirror quite in the right way, so there was a lot of spherical aberration and the primary mirror, and this is what an image of a galaxy was looking like, so quite embarrassing. It was actually built, the mirror, I think the fault was on a contractor from NASA, so we skewed the telescope by sending a uh, space shuttle to uh, sort of install lenses that comes in the, uh, between the mirror and the end of the telescope to sort of correct for the spherical aberration of the mirror. So it's like they installed glasses on James Webb, basic, uh, sorry, on Hubble, basically. Um, so the instrument that is um, correcting for that aberration is called uh, COSTAR. And that's the WC3 uh, camera image of the same uh, object, so that, uh, that Galaxy Messier 100, which taken in 2018. Okay, 
How do we observe atmospheres? Do you know? Sp spectrum, I heard. Yeah. Someone wants, wants to explain? I actually have all of the three here. Um, just to give you a small idea, and we can redo our actually, actually you're going to redo the uh, calculation uh, of the size of a signal um, by a Jupiter sized planet around a Sun like star. Um, what's the uh, radius of Jupiter as compared to the Sun? 10%? Yes. Um, so, because we're talking about surfaces, uh, are you Googling it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I said one. Ah, <laughs> uh, 1%, oops, sorry. 1% one, 1 is the uh, size of the signal, but it's because the radius is 10% smaller. So, if you do the, the, the uh, power uh, 2, then you get 1%. Um, but yeah, if you only have 1%, you just have to do pi L squared divided by pi. L square of the star, and this is what you get, right? You can do it with eclipse as well. So this is the out of eclipse, and this is the eclipse. So you're going to look at the um, differential signal. And what you find at the end is you have something like um, a surface emission multiplied by the radius square. Uh, sorry, the square is not on BP. It's a mistake, right? It's just uh, B is alone, right? Uh, same for. Uh, uh, for the star, and then you can you can get the signal. And actually, the signal in emission is about 10% uh, the signal for hot Jupiter. This time is about 10% the signal of uh, that you get in transit. So it's even a more difficult measurement uh, for the atmosphere. Well, if you the, in in the first um, approximation, you can just take this formula and add plus h for the size of the atmosphere, uh, which gives you this, uh, then you can just say, OK, actually, H will be um, wavelength dependent because it only uh, absorb the wavelengths where uh, you have a molecule to absorb, right? Um, and this way, you can create a spectrum and start uh, your analysis from there. Um, yeah, OK, this is what I explained, very crude. Uh, there is also some way uh, via the scale to know what the size of the atmosphere is, uh, what is the size that you can expect. Um, the cool thing about transit spectroscopy is it's very sensitive to the mean temperature, so the scale height of your atmosphere. So there was the question about the temperature, you can get it from the scale height. Uh, it's also sensitive to clouds, so if it's cloudy, it's going to be fully flat. You don't see any spectral features because they are basically covering everything, and also to molecules. So it's quite nice to uh, uh, use transit for atmospheric uh, um, characterization. So I've uh, run a few models here to show you basically the impact of the different parameters on a spectrum. Uh, this is a typical uh, Jupiter uh, planet, and this is the transit depth. So that uh, quantity here um, as a function of wavelength. And um, you have different temperatures. So you can see if I drop the temperature, let's say, from um, the uh, blue one, which is 12,000, to the red one, well, the size of the feature, which is basically this, they are going to decrease, and it's going to be more difficult to observe uh, this kind of... Uh, this one's going to be more difficult than this one. Uh, then if you add clouds, so for example, you will go from this one to this one, you're masking some of the features, and it becomes difficult again to observe the atmosphere. Uh, then also the abundance of your element is important. Uh, the more you have uh, up to a certain degree, because after um, uh, up to a certain degree, um, it, the more you have, the more you absorb, and the more uh, signature you have. So it's what I was showing here between the green and, and the red. Um, for the secondary atmospheres, so the ones that are heavy, you're actually going to impact this mu, which is the mean molecular weight. And if you see where this is, this is underneath. So higher mu, mu, mean molecular weight means that you're decreasing the size of the atmosphere, and then you don't see anything anymore, which is why the trappist planets are difficult to observe um, for the atmospheres, for example. Is there any question on that? This is all the math you're going to get today. Not really math, right? Questions? No? 
Um, so transits have also been uh, done for Venice. Um, so you can see here the thin atmosphere. So this is basically that thin, I mean, in this screen we don't see it, but it's, it's that thin uh, um, signal that we are trying to extract, right? Um, no, just to go on other difficulties you have with HST. HST, because it was not built to do atmospheres, uh, it's a bit too sensitive for 10 minutes. Wow, okay. Uh, it's fine. It's a bit too sensitive for um, the um, type of star that we observe, so the bright star. Uh, and you basically have to scan the signal on the detector. So basically the telescope just does up and down to not um, um, saturate the detector. Um, and that's a... Uh, uh, spectrum of a real planet here. Um, so there is a very complicated pipeline that I don't have time to go uh, on for now, but basically you need to extract this um, signal here which is spread across the detector. It creates uncorrected light codes which are very uh, complicated because they have ramps. Uh, so uh, those are systematics uh, that are characteristic of HST. So those ones and there is also like uh, long-term ramps. Uh, then you can do this job uh, correct for the uh, light curves and also do that as a function of wavelength. So you get a light curve per wavelength that you're interested in. And from there you can build a spectrum. And from the spectrum you can uh, figure out what was absorbing in uh, the atmospheres. So I have a few examples um, there. Uh, do you know what this thing is here, like everywhere? It's written in the slides. Until it's water. So for all of those planets, all of those at Jupiter, we most of the time find water. Why? Because HST is sensitive to water due to the wavelength coverage from 1.1 to 1.6 micron. The main absorption we have there is water. There's a bunch of other as absorption here, like TIO, VO, and FEH, that uh, and NH3 that I'm sort of highlighting there. There is also carbon-bearing species maybe here, but it's much more um, tentative and it's quite debated whether those molecules are actually there or not, uh, or if they are just fluctuations from uh, statistical, uh, uh, from the, the, just like the systematics of the instrument. Uh, okay, and that's an example of a, a small uh, planet, and you can see here it's basically very flat, so we don't actually see any uh, evidence for molecules in those, because the scale height of the atmosphere is too small, maybe. So I was going to go into atmospheric retrieval techniques, but we're going to skip that, uh, just to say that this is a very complicated um, problem, because we are in a low signal-to-noise regime, and we absolutely want to know what is the significance of all detection, right? So there is a, a bunch of statistical techniques that are developed uh, to uh, know that and to explore the parameter space to find all of the possible solutions for a spectrum. Uh, so I'm just skipping this. Okay, I can get pretty uh, interesting. Um, so there was uh, a few studies that have been looking at the planet, not as single object, but as populations, like those three. Uh, for example, in this one, there was 30 planets analyzed at the same time, and you can recognize here at 1.4 micron that they, most of them have water. So all of that to say that those studies, um, they have basically um, paved uh, the, the, the uh, knowledge of exoplanet by telling us most of the hot Jupiter, they get a lot of water and they're also uh, cloudy. To me, this is what is the most interesting, like looking at the populations instead of a single planet. There's also some speculation on uh, refractory elements, uh, which might come with a trend or not. Uh, then Spitzer, um, so I was going to talk about emission for Spitzer because uh, you can uh, Spitzer looks a bit more in the uh, infrared so it's looking at 4.5 and uh, sorry 3.6 and 4.5 microns instead of 1.1 to 1.6 uh, 
which means the planets which are much cooler emit more at those wavelengths. So you can actually see the eclipse, uh, so the occultation also called, much better uh, with Spitzer. Do you have any question on all of those parts? You all want to go for coffee. Okay, then I'll skip that. Um, I was going to ask you, do you know what this means? So this is a spectrum in um, eclipse. So you see the emission of the planet increases and there is a spectral signature here, right? And there is two speeds of points here. Do you know what this uh, tells us? So this tells us that the atmosphere has uh, water vapor. This is uh, absorption from water, right? And because this is absorption, the thermal profile is going to go by decreasing uh, with altitude. If you add the opposite, so like a um, increasing um, emission, then it means the temperature prof profile go with increasing with uh, altitude. This is quite interesting. So from eclipse, as compared to transit, you can also get some information about the thermal structure, which is quite nice. Um, OK, next decade of exoplanet survey. It's just HST wavelength fringe. Takeaway is very limited. Uh, this is aerial, right? So large coverage. And this is James Webb, so pretty cool. Um, the more we have coverage, the more we're uh, probing different altitudes and the more molecules we can get. So with exoplanet, signal to noise is important, but also wavelength coverage. So Ariel and James are going to be amazing for that. Um, okay, this is an example. Do you know how to read those graphs? No, okay. Posterior distributions, do you know? OK, so we're not going to talk about it then. Just going to show you two videos then. Uh, and we're going to stop there to go for coffee, if you want the rest of the presentation. This is just to show you how crazy uh, the deployment of James Webb was. Just to give an idea, uh, so this is the size of a tennis court, which is quite impressive. Do you have any question while we are watching the video? Is it finished? What? The, the sequence of... Uh, I don't think so. I think they are at the time where they are aligning the mirrors. So it's almost completed. Um, but most of the uh, single point of failure, because there was a few, were happening in this sequence where they opened the sun shield and opened the mirrors. So we're past that sequence, which means we're technically safer. I call it, it's a general purpose observatory. It was initially designed not to do exoplanet either. Uh, so it's doing cosmology, a lot of galaxy. Uh, it's looking at you know, the first galaxy in the universe, uh, things like this. This is just to show you the difference in terms of spectra that we have. This is the sub-Neptune K218b that I was talking about earlier. Um, sub-Neptune or water world, it depends on how you want to interpret it, of course. Uh, but there is a water signature at 1.4 microns. Um, and this is what the observation from Jeps are going to look like. They are the same models, so there are three scenarios. They all look the same in HST, but they are very different in Jeps Web, which is quite nice. So we're going to be able to break basically all of those degeneracies with Jeps Web. Posteriors, uh, some of the planet. Uh, I also wanted to touch a little bit upon uh, three dimensional aspects really quickly. So I don't know if it's going to start. No, it doesn't. I just start it here. Yep. So those are uh, dynamics uh, simulations in 3D of what how Jupiter should look like. And you can see it's very, very dynamic. 
So to me, all of this complexity is going to be super, super interesting because with ChemSweb, we're going to be able to observe those things, right? So all of this uh, um, um, and the temple variations, basically. So you have storms and jets and things like that, uh, which are predicted on exoplanet and should be observable with uh, ChemSweb. So the way you would do it is maybe to do it with phase curve, which uh, allows you to map the uh, um, atmosphere of the planet. So you look at the planet when it goes around the star for a full orbit. And if you do that in spectroscopy, then you can sort of infer the uh, thermal structure and the partition of uh, the molecule in the atmospheres, but in 3D, not just uh, at the terminator or at the day side. Um, yeah, and that's, I'm going to stop after this uh, slide, which is on um, Ariel. So Ariel is going to be launched in 2029. That's another telescope, smaller than GEMSWEB, but as opposed to GEMSWEB, it's going to be dedicated to exoplanets. So it's only going to do exoplanet atmospheres. It's going to be the first mission to do that. It's one meter size. Um, and in its lifetime, it should observe around 1,000 exoplanet atmospheres. So um, it's quite a lot. And from there, you can basically build uh, your population and do the same figures that we've been able to do with Kepler, um, but with the information from the atmosphere. So hopefully break all of the degeneracy about uh, the small planets and, and also uh, understand the chemistry, the structure of the cloud, link the chemistry to the planetary formation, uh, all of those things. Uh, and I'm just going to stop uh, here because uh, I don't have more time and I'm going to move directly to this slide, which is my conclusion slide of all the telescopes that can be used uh, from uh, space to uh, detect or characterize exoplanets. And this is the final slide. Yeah.